anyway. All uh, right, so we're in Hebrews, uh, and we're going to go into a little bit of a deep dive as we go into Hebrews. Uh, so let's pray and, uh, and go into it today. Thank you, Father, for gathering us around your word. Your word is, is life. Um, your word is more certain than the foundations of the earth. And so as we go into it today, we pray that you instill in us even greater the certainty and knowledge of your truth as we seek your kingdom and seek to glorify your name. We pray this in the name of your son who is with us now and in the name of the spirit that leads us into all truth. Amen. All right. Hebrews, we started chapter one and went into a little bit of uh, in depth with regards to what that chapter entails. I want to uh, continue on with that. So, um, chapter one, verse one. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And you will hear when you read through various prophets, not the new translation, but uh, at least in the King James, thus saith the Lord. I don't know how they translate it now. The, the Lord says this, or, but I like the old English. In other words, the Lord is speaking. Whether the Lord gives a vision, which will happen, but if the Lord gives a vision, he always speaks, giving the meaning behind the vision. Um, so God is speaking, and this is a theme that runs through all of Scripture. That's why we frequently use the term, the Word of God. Um, it can mean various things, but it, it together is God speaking, or historically what God has spoken. And the writer of Hebrews is addressing Hebrews, Jews, with regards to what is now, has been testified as being fulfilled among them through the Messiah, through Jesus of Nazareth. And it's important because the prophetic ministry is not really our history. It is a history of the Jews, Israel, and we refer to that history with regards to the revelation of Jesus, but it's not really our history in terms of a direct correlation. There's not a prophet that speaks over America so to speak, or a prophet that speaks over one of the European nations that became Christian. In fact, after Jesus, there's no recorded prophets. There are church fathers, if you will, and mothers that write, and we get their ideas, but they, they're, not, they're not added to Scripture as prophets. And for hundreds of years, Israel held on to the words of the prophets as their source of hope, inspiration, guidance, and revelation. And then it's important to understand that. Because how do we how do we maneuver now? Well, we'll 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 get to that in, in a moment. But going on in Hebrews, at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. There's the, the, the terminology again, his word. Um. This would mean first century, first, first generation of readers, it would mean a, um, 
there is a different quality when someone grows up with something as compared to having it be brand new as an adult. So this would be just the newness of it. The magnitude of what's taking place would have been felt. And I want to take a look at not only what we've just read in Hebrews, but I want to see, I want us to take a look at just how frequent and how essential a, the prophetic history and ministry is. Let's go to uh, the, we'll just take one gospel, uh, Matthew. That's good. Matthew chapter 2. Um, you have the visit of the Magi. Um, and of course, this is in fulfillment of Micah. But I want to go to verse 23 if we can. 23. Um, uh, you know what, let's just back up a little bit. Verse 19 of chapter 2. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Through the prophets. There is a collection. It's not necessarily just a verse here or a verse there, but there is a whole narrative, if you will, of prophetic um, guidance and direction. And Jesus is fulfilling this. The role of the prophet is to lead the nation of Israel as they are living their lives out specifically in relationship to God. So let's just go on a little further. So verse 23, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, more than one, he will be called a Nazarene. Let's go over to chapter 5 of Matthew. Um, okay. Chapter 5, verses 12. Yeah. Let's just, you got the, your Beatitudes. Well, let's, let's start with chapter 5, verse 1, and just get to verse 12. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, this is verse 12, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
very important to understand this because, um, and, and, and let me uh, add to this as well. Um, I have been, um, not, not a lot, but a number of people have come to me with, a, with that interest in the scriptures now. And they've never really maybe been all that involved in a Bible study or anything like that. And when you come, when you approach the scriptures, it can be overwhelming. <laughs> you know, there's 66 books that were written over thousands of years by, depends on how you want to do the authorship, a number of authors. And immediately when you uh, study history, uh, you want to know who wrote this and when they did it. And you want to know dates. And the first thing that will come, well, who wrote Genesis? And the reality is, we don't know. We don't know. They're ascribed to Moses. They're given authority through Moses. Moses was what? A prophet. Obviously, Moses wasn't there when they were written down. They were probably in oral form for many years. Um, before and passed down in that manner. But we have this tendency to, in terms of when we approach something, to approach it from our standpoint, which is we want to know who wrote it, when they wrote it, what language. It, no, they, that, that, that does not apply here. Um, that doesn't mean it's not authoritative. We'll, we'll talk about well, what, what I mean by that is when you study something along, the, along those lines and you say, we don't really know who wrote it, immediately you can just cast it off. And, well, then I'm not going to give it any credit. By the way, science says that the world is billions of years old, and so I can't, I can't, we don't even know who wrote this, et cetera, et cetera. And you begin to um, um, enter into a realm of how do you discern truth? And spiritual truth is always revelation that the mind will not ever be fully able to give authority, give authority to because it's spiritual in nature. Um, so... So when you look when 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 you look at say the first five books of the Bible, um, so certainly some of those things were not written by Moses because it happened to Moses after he was gone or well, you know after he was dead and so forth. But they're ascribed to him because of his ministry and the authority that he had. And at some point in time, you got to go through. If depending on how deep you go. You've got to go deep into your spirit to go, I don't know if this is true or not. God, you're going to have to reveal if it's true and in what way. So this is not any different than what Jesus encountered with his, um, his disciples. In fact, um, hold on to that place in Matthew Please turn with me to the Gospel of John. Um, we're going to look at 6, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, chapter 6. Hmm. All right, in chapter 6, um, he, he's gotten, he, he has fed the 5,000, walked on the water, only the disciples saw that, but now he's in Capernaum, and they find him in Capernaum, and now there's this dialogue. So, in this dialogue, he says, this is verse, let's say, 32. Verse 32. Jesus said to them, 
I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. So now he is directly tying his authority over and above Moses. If you go to Israel, Moses is the end all be all. You got a lot of rabbis that make commentary on the Pentateuch, on the Old Testament, but Moses is that guy. He is their prophet. He is the one that led them out of Israel, and he is the one that ushered them into the promised land. He was the one that gave them the tabernacle worship, the calendar, the, the Ten Commandments or the, the covenant. He is the guy. There are other prophets that are very important, but none tops Moses. None. That's in Judaism. In Islam, none tops Muhammad. In Christianity, Jesus is the prophet. None tops him. But he goes on to say, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, he's talking about manna, because they want a sign from him. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Now, they're very familiar with the manna. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. Now this is, is, by the way, before we came up with the term, this is the scientific method. (laughs) Show me. I need to observe it. Way back in the day, it was called the Baconet. Baconian method from Bacon, who just simply says, whatever you can observe, that's the method. You need to observe it. It has to be observed. You you observe it falling? Okay. You can make hypothesis, if you will, based on your observation, but observation. This is what they're saying. You're saying you you did this. You just fed 5,000. We saw that kind of, but give us a sign specifically. Moses gave us specific signs. He says, but as you, but as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. At this the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This is what I've been recently trying to point out. You are a miracle. You didn't come because somebody taught you this and you got a diploma, although diplomas now are going out. There are no such things anymore, but that's beside the point. There's something at work in you that... Um, is nothing less than supernatural. It's faith. It doesn't mean that it's fully matured and perfect. You will always have doubt. I was talking with the guy the other day. He said, yeah, I wanted to come to church, but you know, I still have doubts. I don't know if I believe. Well, join the crowd. We're a work in progress. And wherever there is doubt, then... God will work through that. That's not nothing. That's not anything to be ashamed of. That's that isn't anything that's that's um, you have to hide or deny. It just it it just is. It's God working through. 
through you to give you confirmation, to give you a certainty. Faith, in the book of Hebrews that we get to later, is the assurance of things hoped for. How do you get assurance? Well, you practice discipleship. How do you know if it's true? You know it's true if it happens. I had to stop this morning and and say and 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 repent a little bit in my own devotional because there were three things that happened that God revealed yesterday that were miracles that I just went on my happy day and went, whoa, I didn't see your favor was upon me. But if you're not looking for it, you won't see it. It's just a happenstance. If you can't see the, the little ones, recognize them, realize them, you won't see the big ones. And the big ones won't make a difference because as we see here, they've already been fed miraculously and they still don't get it. Miracles don't give one. Miracles in and of themselves do not constitute a cause for faith. Because mir- miracles are, are, are supernatural in, as a manifestation of God's, but that is not, but the, but, but the supernatural that takes place within you is faith itself. Does that make sense? Um, it's it's not easy to 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 get to this. Um, we'll we'll do one more time. Uh, he says, "I will raise him up at the last day." It is written in the prophets. Here we are again. They will all be taught by God. This is Isaiah. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. And then later on, he says, "This is what I mean uh, by." unless the Father enables you. He goes on to say, um, this is verse now 65. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. So what God is doing in the same miraculous manner as creation itself is working within you faith, revealing to you faith. Faith comes first, understanding comes second. No one comes to God by reason alone. There's always the context. There's got to be a context. You can't just believe in a God that you have never heard anything about. But with regards to growing in understanding, faith comes first as a seed. Jesus uses the parables time and time again. And this is in congruence with all of his, Israel's history of the prophets going all the way back to Moses. Now, let's go back to to Matthew for... Nah, I'm running out of time. I don't have time to... Yeah, let's just do a few more. We we left with Matthew chapter 5. Let's do Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Yeah, let's go back up a little bit more. This is chapter 7, verse 7. Chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Don't ever give up. This is a promise regarding the kingdom. If you seek, you'll find it. You may not find it in the, in, in the time frame in which you want to find it, but you'll find it. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. It's re, it's, he's talking about the kingdom. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, give good, give good gifts to those 
who ask him. Well, that goes contrary to our nature. We don't expect God to give it. We expect bad things to happen to us. And, and it's, it's not like we don't want to believe that. But there's within the, our nature, Jesus refers to it. You who are evil. Well, I don't want to be thought of as evil. But I have a nature that is prone to evil. Prone to it. It's what Paul talks about. The good that I don't want to do or the evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. So while I'm prone to it, there is this conflict within me that I'm that begin you begin to realize in faith that God is working out by increasing his presence, his spirit within me, and as such, perfect love drives out that nature. It transforms us. So the tendency is there a tendency to violence, etc. But God is greater. He who is in you is greater than he is of the world. In verse 12 then, so in everything do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. This is the authority on which the Jews rest. The law, first five books of, the Mo- of, of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets. Uh, the other books are known as history books, but but they're also prophetic in terms of uh, God working through their history by the prophetic ministry, starting with Samuel. Okay. Um, now let's go to Acts. I don't have, um, yeah, let's just go to Acts. I don't have time. Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I'm going to go to 18. Uh, Acts chapter uh, 3. You know what? Let's start with verse 11, and then we'll get to um, 18. While the beggar held on to Peter and John, All the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... The God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith, In the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has given this complete healing to him, as you can all see. That's uh, verse 16. Verse 17. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold, through all the prophets, there's it is again, saying that his Christ would suffer. Um, going on, verse 19, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. There it is again. For Moses said, and now regarding the prophets now, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Any, anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. 
verse 24. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as we talked about, as many as have spoken have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your forefathers. Uh, he said to Abraham through your offspring, and he, and he continues the chapter there. So the prophetic ministry is... is um, Is, is a foundation, foundation for the manner in which God speaks. Now, the reason why this is important to us is, let's go to, say, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians twelve. First Corinthians chapter twelve. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse, oh, let's go down to 20, mm, 28. Verse, verse 28 of chapter 12. And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, prophets. I'm sorry, apostles. Those are people that are sent out for the specific purpose of being God's representative, his ambassador. God, Paul will write that. You are ambassador for Christ. An ambassador speaks on behalf of the nation that has sent them and relies on the nation's resources to do that work. First of all, prophets. Second, prophets. Third, teachers, then workers of miracles and those having gifts of healing those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers. So, the, 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 I'm going to say this. These are specific roles, but they're not limited to a, to a particular position within the body of Christ. You can have prophets, you can have teachers, you can teach others. You can teach others as much as you know. Okay. Uh, and as God gives his spirit, a prophetic ministry is a ministry that is, a, that is able to discern correctly God's will and God's word in the times in which the prophet lives and within the community to which the prophet belongs. Now, if, if you grew up in the Lutheran church as I did, that ministry is, is foreign. I, I don't know, maybe did anyone come from any tradition that had pro prophets? You did? What? Okay. 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 So that she was a woman in what? Illiterate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, God, God, this is not past tense. So, um, in fact, most of the, the people, and I'm not, I don't call them prophets, but most of the people that I know have an anointing for prophecy are all women. It's only uh, one that I, that's not. So, I mean, that's just my experience. That's not my gift 
Although as I grow in discernment, as God is growing in discernment, um, there is more of a uh, an assurance when I hear uh, when I hear someone speak. My I can I can stand in agreement with it. These are terms that are foreign uh, to us. Standing in agreement. So, for example, remember when they had a disagreement in the church um, uh, in Antioch. What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to do circumcision or not? Because it's it's heated, and uh, they send a delegation to to the apostles in Jerusalem. And do you remember their response regarding circumcision? Well, there's a whole multitude of things, but they basically said, uh, you don't have to be circumcised. It's not a requirement. Um, what we do ask is that you abstain from food sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality. These seem uh, right to us and to the Holy Spirit. This is what we feel is right. They're not speaking prophetically. They're saying this is our discernment, prophetically speaking. The reason why that is important is because we, as you are probably well aware, are in extremely rapid changing times. So the ability to discern among us is paramount. You don't need to discern. There was a time where you really didn't need to discern that much because most, when we came out of the industrial age, everything really began to take on that model, that mindset, the franchise. So not only is the industrial age going to crank out cars, but now we're going to do the same thing with food. Here, just crank it out. Here's a burger, fast food, and I'm dating myself, but I can still remember when having a McDonald's come to your town was a big deal. Anyone ever have that experience? Yeah, that's right. That was their thing. And when I was in high school, McDonald's was opening up, and the high school band was there playing for their grand opening. The newspaper was there. Right? That's the industrial age. And then they would bring you that you could do tours. We did a tour of McDonald's. See how, how clean our industrial plant is. In fact, it's so clean, it's just as clean as your kitchen. And I would, be, I would maybe not be out of line to say, you deserve a break today from, from working in the kitchen. You can trust our kitchens. They're clean. So come here. This is an industrial uh, mode denominations were the same thing. This is our hymnal. Everyone will sing on any given Sunday the same three hymns, the same scriptures. We will all stand at the same time. We will all, if you don't know what to do, don't even have to worry about it. Don't even have to pray about it. We'll give you a guidebook. You don't have to, it was an industrial era. It worked for a while. But when times change, the prophetic ministry is called upon. Right? So this is why it's very important, as we're, we're in an era now, that we understand this anointing of the Holy Spirit that gives direction and wisdom and is able to discern the spirits so that we don't get hamstrung by a spirit that's not of God, but we're listening to that voice thinking that it is. Let's, um, all right, let's go back to Hebrews where we started today. That's the prophetic ministry. All right, now, we left with, now let's just go to verse 3 again and continue on. The Son, now, 
is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That is so key. Why does Jesus in the, in the last part of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, as he is giving his last instructions, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all nations, or as you're rubbing against people from different nations, whether you want to go or just run into them, go into all nations, um, baptizing them, making disciples of all nations. That's the first thing. Um, the, uh, I'm just going to go there because I don't want to. I want to say the words exactly as Matthew uh, ends the chapter. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and first of all make disciples. Don't baptize them first. You, you have to know what you're being baptized into. You don't. You don't just enroll in school and then just go in there and go. Oh, by the way, what 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 uh, what majors do you have? You got to know what you're getting into. So baptize, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And please don't think that's just a ritual saying the right words. This is immersing them in the reality of the presence of the Spirit of God, the Trinity, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That is, that is paramount because as we learn how to obey, it's the obedience we begin to learn just how much God is working and transforming us because the obedience to his word goes from being something that we struggle with or resist to something that's a natural part of our, our, our being. It's habitually natural. So when we, if you could teach someone how not to worry, um, which should be able to do that. That's a command. Don't worry about your life. That's a command. Well, that's a lot easier said than done. And you can get a little resentful at someone that, to that tells you, oh, just don't worry about it. If you ever have families, that can happen. One person just never worries about everything. Why? Because they know this person will worry for them. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> It's not talking about being in a group and realize, I don't have to worry about it because that, that, that person will do all the worrying for me. What are you saying? Don't worry about your life. Well, how do you do that? You're pressured from early on. Okay, so here, th here's a great example of how biblical knowledge is important in the here and now. Jesus says, don't worry about your life. We should know how to do that if we're disciples as a community. We should be able to teach that. But if not, you got a whole bunch of, of, of kids in high school that are so stressed because of the pressure of grades that we're not going to do grades anymore. Done. Have you seen that? Anyone seen that in the paper? The whole state of, of, of Oregon has gotten rid of the requirements with, for math and science to graduate from high school. No requirements. It's too stressful. It's not equitable. Because some kids were getting good grades and some kids weren't, and that's not fair. So we just get rid of it. Am I the only one that thinks that's ridiculous? You, you, you're you're going to do what? So, so the, the diploma is completely meaningless. I went to college and got a music degree. If the, if the same thing were to apply, Ah, it's too stressful. Ah, I can't practice that much. You don't have to practice. You don't have to practice. You're fine. We'll give you a degree. It's not fair that you're stressed out and this person isn't. But if you can teach someone how not to worry about their lives, then that's a different thing. Yeah, I have all this stress because I guarantee you, once you get out of high school or out of college, the, the real world doesn't go away. Unless your plan is to live with your mom and dad until whatever. So how do you how do you then not worry? Well, discipleship. What does that mean, discipleship? 
means you learn how to pray. It means you learn how to go through things with prayer. It means you become more and more familiar. You're not the first, here's a surprise, you're not the first person that's ever been stressed on the planet. Nor are you the first generation. You go back to generations that had it really, really, really much difficult, and their faith was at a completely different level than ours. And so this book contains a number of people that had more than enough reason to worry and to fret. The end of Matthew, but, and remember, I'm with you always. Okay, As we learn that, as we put that into practice, it, be, it, it, it transforms our habitual nature to be one that is Christ-like. Christ gives us his word. We learn to obey it. And as such, the word actually comes from the Father. It didn't originate with him. And it's the Father working within us so that not, on, not only do we believe what Jesus said, we also believe what he believed. I've never seen in all of the artwork, Christian artwork, i never seen any sculpture, any painting, any stained glass of Jesus wringing his hands in worry. Do you think he worried? He was troubled, but that's different. When he was going to the cross, he was certainly troubled. That's not the same as living a life of worry. Because if you live a life of worry, as soon as this situation has resolved itself, you you're waiting for the next one. And if the next one hasn't appeared yet, you're worried that it hasn't appeared yet. <laughs> and on and on and on. So let's go to Hebrews then. To which of the angels? Now yeah, go to verse 4. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father, or I will be his father and he will be my son. This is uh, 2 Samuel. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says that all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says... In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Now, all of that revelation regarding the Old Testament scriptures are, are, came or are, are quoted in view of the revelation of who Jesus is. The revelation of faith came first. The understanding then of the scriptures through that faith, came second. So I keep on saying, you're a miracle. What, what is happening within you is nothing less than a supernatural act of God. Um, any questions on that before we go into chapter 2 in the morning? we got five minutes left, all right. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. 
This is the temptation of every human being, given Israel's history. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, all right, so this now he's building this up. Angels were the intermediary of the covenant with God, as the author is writing. They, on behalf of God, speaking on behalf of God, gave Moses the, the, the commandments. Okay? Whether you want to say God met with him or not, that's, we're not, that's not at issue here, whether it's God, company of angels. God is always with the company of angels. God is never all by himself. There's always a company of the heavenly realms. You've heard him, you've heard the Lord of hosts. Remember that phrase? That phrase comes from that. It's a Hebrew word, uh, Ella, it's not Elohim. It's not El Shaddai. Mm, I can't remember it. But it's translated in, in the King James, the Lord of hosts. So what he's saying here is, for if the message spoken by angels, meaning that was given to Moses, was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? So what he's saying to the Jews is, look, Moses gave you this and the whole history of Israel by the prophets were, were the prophets speaking to Israel giving them direction because they were turning away from this original covenant that was given through Moses. The whole prophetic ministry was, you're going the wrong direction. You are abandoning the covenant. Why are you going after other things? You're breaking the covenant. What are you doing? There's going to be bad things that happens if you break the covenant. Basically, the prophetic ministry of Israel until God just said, I'm done and, and allowed Israel to be taken over. Now, the writer is saying, all right, in the same way, God is speaking to us, but now not through an angel, through the Mosaic Covenant, but through his son, the weight of it is heavier. Don't let, we cannot drift away from it. Yes. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. I know it's on many different TV shows. I know it's been, I, I know I'm very many, or not very many, I know of a number of preachers and teachers that talk about Satan being cast out of heaven. You show me in scripture, that doesn't mean that there's not a tradition. There is a tradition regarding it, but it's not found in scripture. You're using a pre presumption that's not in scripture. You're, you're basing a whole, ide not ideology, a theology on something that's not in Scripture. We don't know the origin of what is in Scripture is what's in Scripture. The serpent was there in the beginning. Doesn't say that the serpent fell from the sky. There is in Isaiah a, a script, one Scripture, O oh bright, oh bright star that have fallen, how far you have fallen. In the King James, they take that Latin word and they, or, or they take the Latin word for that and use Lucifer, meaning the bright star. But if you read the NIV version, if you read the ABC, if you read uh, the Christian Standard Version, if you read any of those versions, the word Lucifer isn't there. It's only in the King James Version and only in one chapter. That doesn't mean that there aren't traditions that surround that. I'm saying when it comes to the canonized scripture, there's nothing about Luther or uh, uh, the, having, uh, the devil being the top musician, being thrown, it's not in there. I'm not saying you shouldn't give it thought, but when it comes down to solid biblical teaching, it's not there. Okay, Scripture also reminds us, be careful not to run after uh, various, uh, gosh, where does Paul say that? Be careful that you don't out run after various um, teachings that lead you astray. There's enough mystery and power in what took place in Jesus' ministry and his teaching that you don't need to... And, and it's a temptation because, oh, yeah, where did he come from? Ooh, I wonder. And then you get an ABC, or not ABC, you get a History Channel doing something, and it, it's a waste of time. I've done it, and in the end, you, you can't, I, I can't tell you how many books I've read on the Nephilim. 
and <laughs> okay, you know, um, but but learning how to obey Jesus' words and teaching, that's the key. That's the key. That's 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 the most important for me. Um, so it is speculation, and you're not going to have a shortage of people, especially on the uh, on the Christian channels. Because, gosh, you got to be exciting. you got to be exciting if you're going to have someone tune in. And it's very exciting. End time. Okay. Let's just make sure that we're grounded in this thing and not get lost in the spectacular. That's just me. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, end there and pick up Chapter 2 next time of Hebrews. Um, when we we got all the way with chapter one we're we're done with chapter one just a reminder oh uh we we made some phone calls uh i think we're helen were you able to call everybody that we talked about on that list that we created everybody's cool if we switch, switch blah, 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 in january to wednesday i don't want to do it right one who can't do it oh who's that oh you can't do wednesdays Oh, okay. Well, that's important to know. I'll have to. Yeah, well. Still a consideration. What's that? I just uh, have just been contemplating, kind of feeling like it would be nice to do a midweek. Um, so that you have the Sunday thing and then midweek you have something that's middle of the week. It's pretty common for most churches, but it doesn't have to be. So. Yeah, I'll pray about it. I, I, nothing's written in stone. So, all right, we have our uh, Thanksgiving service uh, this Wednesday. Hope that you can make that, invite some friends, and uh, celebrate God, gratefulness. Lord, thank you for your goodness and kindness for your word as we continue to um, grow in you and, and continue to mature as your spirit works in us and and give us a deeper faith, a, a deeper understanding, a, a deeper certainty. May we walk in the in praise and adoration for who you are. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day.